I'm a scientist. Actually, I'm a principal investigator. And that means I run a lab, I have grad students, I do research, and I teach. And I look like this. <laughs> you might think I look like a scientist, or maybe you don't. What does a scientist look like anyway? This is what I'm here to talk to you about today. I've been thinking a lot about this, and it might seem like a weird thing to think about, but let me explain. To do that, I have to take you back in time, a few days, or a few years, actually. I remember it really well. It happened one night. I was, it was after work, and I was at home. I was lying on the couch reading a magazine. I was reading Science or Nature. I don't remember which one, because I read them both. These are the premier science journals in the whole world. And if you publish in one of these, it, it'll make your career, right? You'll get the job. You'll get the promotion. These are the holy grail journals, right? But they don't just publish sciencey articles. They publish like editorials. They publish biographies. They even publish short stories. And, and that's why I read them. They kind of reflect the culture of science today. So I was lying on the couch, and I was reading this magazine. But instead of relaxing, I was getting more and more agitated and irritated. And I actually threw the magazine across the floor. I was like, what is going on? Why do I feel this way? So I picked it up, and I sat down. And I decided to look at it more objectively. It didn't take me very long to figure out what was going on. There were pictures of men doing science. There were pictures of men recruiting men to do science. And there were advertisements of men doing science. It was a love of letter to men from men. Or as my colleague put it, it was a sausage fest from cover <laughs> to cover. <laughs> but I thought, why does this bother me? I mean, it's not as though I'm immune to sexism in science. I'm a feminist. I'm highly attuned to it. But I love those journals, and I really feel like they let me down. I was so disappointed. So I, I carried this feeling around with me for a few days until I was meeting with one of my students. And I was trying to recruit this student to be uh, one of my grad students. She's fantastic. She's really smart. She's driven. She's curious. She's a great writer. She's the whole package. But she couldn't see herself as a grad student. She couldn't see herself being an academic scientist. And OK, fair enough, I get it. It's not for everybody. But she was different. She was really good at it. And more importantly, she seemed to love it. So why was she taking herself out of the running before even trying? Actually, it's not that unusual. Um, it's called the leaky pipeline. You guys might have heard of it. It's a metaphor used to describe the attrition of women from science. Basically, what starts off as kind of equal cohorts of girls and boys early on in their education in science um, ends up as, by the time they get to the end of their career path and, and a senior scientist, there's almost no women left. They've leaked out of the pipeline. Now, there's many reasons or theories about why there is a leaky pipeline. NSERC which is our national funding body for science in Canada. They commissioned a uh, study a few years ago to examine the leaky pipeline. And what they did was they followed a cohort in 1985. So they took grade ones in 1985, and they followed them throughout their career um, trajectory to see where they ended up. So there was about 200,000 girls and boys, roughly. Out of 200,000 girls, how many do you think ended up as a... Uh, senior scientist? One. One. OK, maybe you're surprised. Maybe you're not. I mean, how many academics does the world need, right? Maybe one's enough. But if you compare her to the boys in her cohort, 18 of those got to be a primary investigator. It's a pretty dramatic difference. Why are girls leaving science in such dramatic numbers? I mean, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of different theories. Like I said, I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories, and I'm going to tell you some of them tonight. People have um, done some research, like I said, even science. Science and nature aren't all bad, those journals. They do cover gender bias quite a lot. Science did a study last year, published one, and it was really interesting because it showed that girls, until they're six years old, they see intelligence as gender neutral. But after six, they'll only identify pictures of boys or men as being really, really smart. 
So what's happening to these girls between the age of five and six? That they suddenly stop seeing themselves as being smart. Because if they don't see themselves as smart, there's no way they're going to make it through the pipeline. Well, obviously, you go from five to six, you go from primarily a culture of your home to a culture of the world, right? You're in school full time. What culture are they absorbing? And what messages from that culture are they absorbing? I started to think about my experience with that magazine and how it might not be the big, ugly, me too, sexist moments that are driving women out of science, but it might be these more subtle, more pervasive messages that you just don't belong here. You don't even look like a scientist. And maybe that's why my student couldn't see herself in grad studies, because she literally couldn't see herself reflected in the media. I couldn't recruit her to be a grad student, not yet anyways, but I did recruit her to be an honor student, and together we did a study, and we, went back, we wanted to test my, the hypothesis I had that science and nature were disproportionately representing men in their pages. So we got back issues from both of those journals, and we poured over hundreds and hundreds of images and articles just to count how many times were they showing men versus women. And I was right. Both journals disproportionately showed men in their pages. OK, this is an advertising feature. An advertising feature is paid content. It looks like a, an article in a magazine, but it's not. It's really an advertisement. 95% of the photos associated with these advertising features were of men. 95%. Clearly, corporations don't think that women look sciencey enough. But this was true across the board for all the categories of photographs and articles we looked at. So I wonder, what is the effect of consuming media like that? A media where you are, as a woman scientist, you're invisible. Or as a girl who wants to be a women, woman scientist, you're invisible. Well, I have a little bit of insight into that. I mean, I could tell you, I could sit here tonight and tell you literally hundreds of stories of how I almost leaked out of the pipeline, how I wanted to leak out of the pipeline, how I tried to leak out of the pipeline. I could tell you some really ugly, really horrible stories, predatory advisors, complete, utter lack of female um, mentors. But I truly don't believe that that's what's keeping women um, from science. I think in some ways we're taught to anticipate those big events, to watch out for them. What we're not taught to watch out for is this insidious, pervasive culture that whispers in our ears every single day, you don't look right, you don't belong. So I want to tell you about a few of my experiences, not because I think my experiences are unique, but because my experiences are not unique. I think that's what makes them important. So let's start with my bachelor's degree. I started my BSc, and I wanted nothing more than to be a wildlife biologist, because I loved nature. I loved being in nature. I wanted to save nature. And I realized pretty early on, in order to do that, I was going to have to infiltrate this inner circle, this inner circle of faculty, grad students, and undergrads who worked together and collaborated and wrote papers together. So I was thrilled. In my third year, I got a job with one of them. And I got to go live up in northern Saskatchewan and study birds. And it was so beautiful. It was just so far north. We were so remote. It was just spectacular. But pretty soon, a pattern developed. Every night after supper, the boys, because I was there with a bunch of men, the boys would go down to the lake for a swim. And I was told, pretty much verbatim, do not come down to the lake. We like to swim naked. You're not welcome. So night after night, I would sit in camp by myself, and I would hear them down at the lake cavorting, bonding, um, collaborating, planning. And I could tell, I could just sense I was never going to penetrate that circle. And I didn't. So by the end of my undergraduate, I felt really discouraged. And I didn't know how I was going to get in. And so I took a year off, and I just kind of wandered around, wondering what to do next. Well, a year later, I'm back in the pipeline. This time I'm doing my master's, I'm doing it in forestry, in a lab full of men. And I was like, forestry, what was I thinking? Yeah. Well, I was thinking that I loved forests. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> but I was harassed from the minute I entered that program until the second I left. And I think back, 
that 22-year-old, we were in camps a lot, remote field camps, living with these men. I think back to that 22-year-old who thought she had to laugh at all the blowjob jokes. And I feel such compassion for her because she thought, she thought she had to act so tough to be a scientist, that she had to act so tough just to prove that she belonged there. But she didn't. After I defended my thesis, I gathered up every scrap of paper I had ever used, and I threw them in the recycling, and I felt so relieved. I was out of science for good this time. I applied to journalism school, and I was in Ontario the next week. But a year later, I'm still in Ontario, but I'm not in journalism school anymore. They told me I could expect to make $15,000 a year as a journalist, so I was out of there. So I'm doing my PhD, but this time is different. I love it. I'm doing ecology. I'm publishing. I'm going to conferences. I'm meeting people. It felt so good. For the first time in my life, I felt, yes. I'm actually where I'm supposed to be. But that feeling didn't last long, and not everyone shared it. Shortly after I started my PhD, I, was, I met the um, head of the department, and he said to me, he said, oh, who are you doing your master's with? And I said, I'm not doing my master's, I'm doing my PhD. He said, oh, you might want to think about that. You don't want to overqualify for a technician's position. <laughs> That's not the worst thing you can say to a person. It's pretty benign, right? But you have no idea how many times I've heard that. And not only that, it confirmed my deepest fear about myself. My deepest fear was that I didn't belong. I didn't look like I belonged. And I was right, because everyone else could see it. He said so. So when I got pregnant at the end of my PhD, I was relieved. I just dropped out. One year became two years of mat leave, became almost three years of mat leave. But eventually, I'm back in the pipeline again. There's only one reason I got back into the pipeline at this point. I should have leaked out. I absolutely should have leaked out. But I had a fellowship that I had deferred from my PhD. So I had money waiting for me. And I know that's the only reason I'm here today. But my postdoctoral fellowship, well, what can, so many things I could tell you that happened during that postdoc, but I'll just, I'll just share one. It was near the end of my postdoc, and I was pregnant again, very pregnant, about eight months pregnant with my second child. And I was walking down the hallway one day, and this professor emeritus approached me, and I'd never spoken to him before. He was really famous. He'd written all the books in my field. And I was so excited because it was clear he was coming to talk to me. He was walking straight towards me. So he came up to me, and he looked at my belly, and he looked at me, and he said to me, he said, what are you doing? You were making the biggest mistake of your life. You should be at home. And I, I didn't say anything. He just turned around and walked away. So I had my baby, and I got the hell out. And yet, here I am. Here I am, UBCO. I've got tenure. I made it. I survived the pipeline. Yes and no, like lots of yeses, but there's still some no's. I mean, I regularly get mistaken for a grad student. I'm 45. <laughs> um, I think to a lot of people, I still don't look like a scientist. But I'm not worried about me. I'm going to be OK. I, I, I think I can manage this from now on. I'm worried about them. I'm worried about those little girls those maybe a handful of little girls in that cohort of 200,000 who want to be scientists but just can't see themselves that way. What are we going to do for them? We know about the pipeline, the leaky pipeline. We understand it. We've got all sorts of insight into how and why it happens. How are we going to stop it from happening? I think one of the first things we need to do as women in science is to start talking about these experiences of being marginalized and feeling alienated. It does no one any good to pretend we don't feel that way. So that when a student comes to me, like mine did, and says, I don't feel like a real scientist, she needs to know that no woman I know feels like a real scientist, especially not me. But that can't stop her from trying to see herself in that way. Thank you very much. <laughs>